Now, to tie it all together here, and I'll end the video right after this, and we'll continue to review Shelley's video in the coming weeks, but I mentioned earlier how all of these confessions of faith say something along the lines of God being without body, parts, or passions. And I want to focus in on that word parts there. God is without parts. Now, this is an affirmation of the doctrine of divine simplicity, which is a common Christian conviction. Now, it's actually one of my favorite topics of theology. I find it fascinating, but I realize most people find the topic boring. However, I do think it's worthwhile to go over it briefly here so that you understand why it is that all of these different Christian traditions found it necessary to say that God is essentially one. He's one being, and that God is one mind and one will, and that the persons of the Trinity are not these different minds and wills with their own distinct attributes, because that would be a violation of divine simplicity. Now, divine simplicity states that God is simple. We don't mean that God is easy to understand. What we're saying is that God is not a composite being. He has no parts. You don't put parts together to make him to be either physical parts or metaphysical parts. So it's not like you put a body together to make God exist or that God is broken down into eternality, love, omnipotence, omniscience, and you put these things together and God comes into being. Right? God is not made up of parts, either physical or metaphysical. And you must affirm this if you're going to say that God is self-sufficient. Now, almost every professing Christian would agree that God is self-sufficient. He is ase. He has aseity. He does not depend on anything other than himself to exist. And he is the first being. The problem is that if you say that God is made up of parts of any kind, then he is no longer self-sufficient. He is no longer dependent solely upon himself because he depends on these parts to exist. And he also depends on someone to put these parts together. So you see what the problem is. In this case, if God is made up of parts of something, let's say 50% love and 50% justice, then you would need love and justice to come together to make him to be. And this is obviously even worse if you try to introduce a body <laughs> into it the way the new IFP does. But you can't say that God is made up of parts because then there's more fundamental things in God that are not God. And so God depends on these things to come together and someone to put them together in order to exist. And so we have said historically as Christians that God is not the sum total of parts he's not eternality plus love plus omnipotence plus omniscience shake it together and you make god well we have confessed historically that all that is in god must be god whatever is in god just is god there is no distinction between god and his attributes and you see that this is scriptural god is love for example the bible says god is light love is not something god possesses that is distinct from himself as if it's a part of him or something like that God just is love, the Bible says. God just is light. God is existence himself. I am that I am. He identified himself to Moses. So you see that this distinguishes the creator from the creature. Because, for example, I have existence. I have existence, but I am not existence itself. God is different. God is existence itself. And so historically, Christians have said that God is his very attributes. And ultimately, his attributes are are each other. There actually isn't a distinction in God between his eternality or his love or his omnipotence. We see a distinction because we're finite creatures and we have to break down our understanding of God into parts. But in God himself, his eternality is the same as his love, is the same as his omnipotence, is the same as his omniscience. And so we can say, for example, that God's eternality is a loving eternality and that God's Love is a omnipotent love, and that God's omnipotence is an omniscient omnipotence. They're all ultimately just adjectives for each other, because it's really just one thing in God. There's not these several different attributes. We see them as several different attributes because we're finite, but in God, it's just one thing. It is himself. God is his attributes. God is simple. Now, the classical orthodox doctrine of the Trinity is consistent with divine simplicity because the persons are not defined as separate instances of divine attributes like the son has his own mind and will over here and the father over here the, the spirit over here the persons are defined by their relation to one another by their eternal relation of origin the father is of none the son eternally begotten of the father the holy spirit eternally proceeds from both the father and the son and when you think about it relations are the only properties that do not constitute parts so, for example, if you think of a tree, a big, huge tree, and a man standing on the right of that tree, that is a relation that the tree has, but it does not constitute a part in the tree. So, for example, even if you were to 
zap the man out of existence, that has not changed the tree whatsoever. It does not add or take away a part from the tree. Now, that's a rough analogy, and you can't take that too far, but it does let you understand the concept of a relation not being a part of something, not being something that will ultimately make the object which has the relation a composite thing. So, when you think about the historic doctrine of the Trinity, each person just is the divine essence itself. Each person just is God. And so the fullness of the divine nature is in each person. And the article recognizes this as being the necessary implication of the Athanasian Creed. So for example, it says here, the simplest sort of oneself theory affirms that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent, the one divine self, and each person of the Trinity just is that same self. The Athanasian Creed seems to imply that each person just is God. Correct. Because we hold to divine simplicity. Each person just is God. But they're truly distinct from one another. By their relation to one another. But these relations do not constitute parts in God. It's the only type of property that would not constitute a part in God. Now, in contrast, social Trinitarianism, and definitely the new IFB version of social Trinitarianism, violates this crucial Christian conviction of divine simplicity. Because, for example, each person cannot be said to possess the full divine nature. Because the divine nature includes two other minds or wills or brains that one person alone does not possess. So you can't say the Father possesses the full divine nature because the Father only has one mind and will, and yet the Son and the Spirit have their own, which the Father does not have. Do so you understand what the problem is? Never mind how bad this gets when you introduce multiple bodies, bodies eat, and bodies themselves are made up of parts, and then furthermore, you're going to say that God has multiple bodies, each of these bodies made up of parts, and then further, you have the three parts of the bodies, and then the minds and the wills. I mean, this is a gross violation of what Christianity has historically affirmed God to be, a simple being. If you think of, for example, Shelley's favorite analogy, he said this, in one of his sermons that we covered in the past, that the best analogy he can think of for the Trinity is a three-layer cake. So three layers of cake. There are three distinct layers, but they're one cake. And they're fully God, too. It's not like this is just part of God or part of God. They're all 100% God. The best analogy I've ever used, in my opinion, is a tri-layer cake. And you can watch that sermon if you want to. But basically, each layer is cake, but it makes up one cake. And you say, well, how's that true? Well, eat a trial or cake, okay? That's a cool assignment. And yes, I do believe that there is three persons. Think about how this doesn't make any sense. Because there is more cake in the entirety of the whole cake than there is in any one layer. So not any of the layers possesses the full cakeness, if you will. But the doctrine of the Trinity confesses that each of the persons just is God. Each of the persons possesses the full divine nature, possesses everything it means to be God. And the social trinity, and definitely the new IFB trinity, cannot assert this crucial conviction. The NIFB trinity is composed of physical and metaphysical parts. None of the divine persons can possibly possess the fullness of the divine nature because by definition they each possess specific attributes that the other does not so it's impossible to ever say that any one of them is the fullness of the divine nature it really is a departure from historic orthodox christianity